And all right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Experiencing just a few technical difficulties. It's kind of fun. I'll let uh, our presenters uh, explain that as they want. <laughs> um, welcome to Expanding Housing that Addresses Homelessness Through Public Private Partnerships. That's the workshop that you're in. And um, my name is Barry Cram. I'm with the Community Engagement Office here at the <clears throat> City of Fort Worth. And um, I'll be your host uh, for this workshop. Um, before we get started, it, you've probably already heard the drill, but um, just in case this is your first time to be in a workshop, there are different ways that you can interact um, with uh, pr the presenters and with the material as well as, as with each other. And I just want to, I want to show you, um, you know, at the top right hand of your screen, you see the inbox. Of course, if you see a, a dot, like a green or red dot that pops up, someone's messaging you uh, privately. And they very well may do that, especially if you leave a comment or something that's substantive and somebody wants more information, um, people can, can see uh, who's in the workshop and they might just um, message you. So just be aware of that. And those are private conversations. Um, the next tab that you see, or the, the first icon under inbox is the chat which is what you saw when you first came in. Great place to say hi. All of these comments are public, okay? They're not private. So just be aware of that. And great great way to, to chat um, and with each other while, uh, while the presentation is going on, or if you have a comment. Um, all of these comments and different texts and the media, it's all being archived that have a shelf life um, for a few months after the conference. So under the chat icon is the question icon. You see that? And I actually posted a question. Did you see what I did there? Do questions really go here, right? If you have a specific question about the presentation or the content, please put it here. Don't put it in the chat. Put it in... Uh, the question uh, icon, because at the end we'll have some Q&A and I'll be able to see them more clearly and consolidate it all in one spot. So um, please, uh, please do that and we'll do our best to respond at the very end. Um, the one below that, you'll see a poll and I do believe there is a poll for you guys to, to answer. So, um, click on that and answer it. The, the tab below that is the people. Of course, that's where you can see who's in attendance, who's presenting, who's kind of in this area, and then, um, and then who are the viewers, those of you who are participating. Um, and then the last tab is where you can find um, any additional information. It's the files tab. We've actually uploaded the presentation Flora has um, already given that. And so it's in PDF form, but feel free to click on that if you want this and you can download it. It'll open up in a different browser. So um, you can do that even now if you want. And and so, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, after the presentation is over, um, just know that we're going to have, um, you know, some Q and A. So be ready for that. Uh, so with that, I'll just introduce um, Flora Brewer. She is with the Paulos Foundation here in the city of Fort Worth. And uh, I was actually going to introduce um, all her panelists, but I'm going to let her do that. And um, hopefully, she'll um, be able to take it away. Flora, are you there? Here. <laughs> all right, go for it. Thanks so much, Barry, and thank you all so much for coming to our workshop. Uh, in case you saw the, the wild uh, gyrations of my image, <clears throat> my, the power went out in my house at, at 941. So I'm quickly pivoting to telephone, and Barry is going to help me advance slides and so forth. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so the show must go on. <laughs> so we are so happy today to have the opportunity to share our experiences over the last several years, figuring out how to bring together the resources of the city of Fort Worth, a major church, major foundations, and private developers to build housing for people emerging from chronic homelessness. Let me start by giving you an overview of the workshop. First, I'm gonna give each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about how they got involved in our Quail Trail project. <clears throat> then I'm gonna make a brief presentation with Barry's help uh, that shows the nuts and bolts of our project, including the approach we took and what each partner contributed. Then I'm gonna ask our panelists some questions. Um, to help them talk about how the partners came together and what we've learned about the challenges of public-private partnerships. And then finally, really want to take your questions. Um, please uh, feel free to use the chat uh, and uh, record your questions in the questions app, and, and we'll leave lots of time at the end to deal with those. I know it, nobody happens to come to a, a a workshop on homelessness, unless they're particularly interested in homelessness. So um, we look forward to talking with you. So starting with introductions, uh, again, I'm Flora Brewer, and I've been a commercial property developer in Fort Worth for about 20 years, um, among a lot of other things that I've done. Um, but because of the location of my properties, I got very interested in homelessness. And I attacked the issue through a lot of community engagement and through my businesses. Um, also founded a neighborhood association in the area where all our homeless shelters are located. In 2015, I bought an old apartment building um, to renovate for housing for people emerging from chronic homelessness. I was able to do the project independently through our family foundation. But after that, I wanted to do it again, but I needed partners. I couldn't do another project by myself. So uh, that journey led me to Tara Perez. So Tara, please tell us about your day job and how you got involved in this project. Thank you, Flora. Um, so my day job is the manager of Directions Home. We are a two-person homelessness unit in the city manager's office at the city of Fort Worth. I've been here about five years. Um, how I got involved was several years ago visiting Palm Tree and seeing what amazing work that Flora and her team had done there. And also just touching on her last question saying, how can we replicate this? And so that led to... Um, advocating for the city to allocate $5 million in housing finance corporation funds for the creation of permanent supportive housing and getting commitments from local foundations to match that dollar for dollar. So really just trying to put together that pool of 10 million that we could use to develop at least 200 units of permanent supportive housing. Thank you, Tara. Tara, uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Randy Gideon, our designer, to um, also tell us his day job and uh, how in the world he got involved in, in this project. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm a practicing architect still. I've been practicing architecture for almost 50 years and uh, been developed at some level in community development and redevelopment for most of that time. Uh, I'm also a member of a 100-year-old uh, congregation of a Methodist church here in Fort Worth that resides in a, a neighborhood that has lots of challenges with uh, one of them being certainly uh, experiencing dealing with uh, people uh, experiencing homelessness. And about five or six years ago, a young pastor in our church approached me and said, you know, there's a building in our neighborhood that would make great uh, housing for uh, for some homeless uh, people. And, uh, and I said, well, uh, being on the leadership team of the church, I thought that'd be a good thing our church could do for the community. So I started down that trail 
very uh, naive and uneducated and quickly uh, realized how much I did not know about uh, homelessness and uh, the issues surrounding homelessness. And soon uh, Tom Purvis, my real estate partner, graciously joined me in the quest. And uh, over that time, we learned a lot about, uh, you know, funding and it being the least of our issues with politics being the greatest of our issues. And uh, we began uh, began looking for uh, more partners that were smarter than we were that, that could help us uh, maybe build some uh, homeless uh, housing, uh, permanent supportive <clears throat> housing here in Fort Worth. Thank you, Randy. Over to you, Tom. All right. I'm Tom Purvis. I've been in the uh, commercial real estate business for about uh, 40 years, primarily in the development side. And as Randy kind of explained, Randy and I have been working together for about 10 years on all sorts of projects. We do kind of uh, unique, uh, special projects like historic redevelopments and that sort of thing. Um, I've been a longtime supporter of a number of homeless uh, initiatives here locally. Uh, when this opportunity came along and it really uh, for me, came on by way of an introduction to Tara and able to kind of plug into her vision. Uh, I'll say a couple of years ago, three years ago, I, I had never heard of permanent supportive housing. Uh, I've gotten a great education. I think it's a great model and look forward to telling you more about it. As Randy alluded, um, you know, fortunately uh, in our community, raising the funding for building the project is, is not the hardest part. Uh, the hardest part is finding sites and, you know, get going through the logistics of getting something built. But we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. Thanks, Laura. And last, Steve. Hey, Job, is I'm real property director for the Tarrant Regional Water District in Fort Worth, which is a large regional water authority uh, based in Fort Worth. Um, in addition, I'm a member of uh, First Presbyterian Church of Fort Worth, which is a big downtown church and also an elder there. Um, I'm currently the board chair for the New Leaf Community Services uh, nonprofit and um, also a board member of DRC Solutions, which is a nonprofit here in Fort Worth that provides case management and housing solutions for the homeless and also a member of our church's mission outreach committee. So I've had a long um period of experience with uh, advocating and serving for the vulnerable in our community. Um, back in um, uh, 30 years ago or so, I guess, just to give you an idea of uh, our church's focus, um, we were instrumental in creating the Presbyterian Night Shelter in Fort Worth, which is, I think, currently the largest emergency shelter for homeless in our city. Um, also in partnership with the Trinity Habitat for Humanity, our congregation has built nearly a hundred habitat homes in Fort Worth. Um, we have a community center named Community Crossroads in which our church volunteers and staff uh, provide services such as a free dental clinic, groceries, clothing, formula and diapers, COVID vaccinations now, and other physical and spiritual needs for the community. Um, in about 2018, our church was un embarking on a uh, renovation of our parking lot, which we ended up spending about $2 million on. And um, um, at the time, our pastor, uh, Carl Travis, um, knowing that our uh, passion and uh, was for the homeless, said, you know, if we can spend $2 million on a parking lot, maybe we need to spend $2 million on uh, helping our community uh, homeless situation as well. And so uh, our church gifted a million dollars toward for uh, developing uh, uh, permanent supportive housing and a million dollars to the night shelter in which they built uh, a brand new men's shelter uh, that they ended up naming after that pastor. Um, I uh, was asked to be on a task force to um, basically um, just consider how we might be able to use this $1 million gift. And um, at that time, we were introduced to Tara Perez and 
Tom and Randy and Flora Brewer, and uh, we all seemed to converge on the fact that we were trying to do the same thing. And so we we formed uh, what eventually became New Leaf Community Services, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. As, as you can see, I have amazing partners. And that's that's a big part of our message to everyone today is uh, uh, these partners from all different sectors of our community is what really helped us get this done. Um, now let me give you a briefing uh, with the slides uh, attached and Barry's gonna help me uh, navigate these slides. Uh, as, as Steve, and I'll kind of go back over some of the things you've heard already, and I'll start to try to help you understand who are all these, these people and who are all these names. Um, again, put your questions in the question app and we'll get to those at the end. As Steve described, one of the, uh, and Tara, the immediate catalyst for our project was a proposal from the city of Fort Worth to put money into housing projects for chronically homeless people that could be matched by contributions from the private sector and philanthropy. In response, we created New Leaf Community Services to create a platform from which to attract partners, with the mission of creating innovative housing solutions for people experiencing chronic or long-term homelessness. Next slide. New Leaf brought together partners from many sectors, assembling the pieces necessary to site, design, finance, build, and place into operation 48 new units of housing, including social services and individual case management. We needed partners who could not only help us assemble the funding for the project, but help us navigate policy and political issues like site selection, tax exemptions, and zoning. Next slide. The next critical catalyst for the project was the commitment of a million dollars from First Presbyterian Church that allowed us to attract other private donors and foundations. New Leaf served as the developer and owner of the project. Some of the major donors, including First Presbyterian and the Paulus Foundation, serve on our board of directors. Randy and Tom of L2L Development uh, had been working on finding properties and creating designs, and they became our project managers, providing real estate and design services and ex expertise we also partnered with a local nonprofit provider of housing services for homeless people, DRC Solutions. Next slide. Now, let me backtrack and say a little more about the problem we were trying to address. We currently have issues throughout the United States in providing housing that people can afford. We address these issues through the market, primarily through the low income low income housing tax credit program. However, since the rise of homelessness in the 1980s, we've developed local homelessness response systems that channel federal funding to prevent homelessness for those who are on the edge, emergency shelter for homeless people, short-term congregate transitional housing, short-term scattered site housing that's provided rapidly when people become ho become homeless, and finally, long-term supportive housing for people who've been chronically homeless. Next slide. Supportive housing is housing for people with disabilities who've been homeless for a long time or who have been repeatedly homeless with the greatest barriers to getting housing. Supportive housing includes low barriers to entry, such as criminal background friendly landlords, long-term rental subsidies, where the resident pays only 30% of their income. Individual case management by trained social workers, including coaching, problem solving, supportive services, and connecting residents to resources to help people with disabilities maintain their housing. Next slide. Here are some of the resource connections provided to residents both on and off site by our case managers. Additionally, in our model, units are fully furnished, 
and residents are also provided with cleaning supplies, free laundry machines and detergent, and hygiene items that are difficult to afford. Next slide. So how urgent is the need for this type of housing? Uh, to put it into context, more than 18,000 people were served in emergency shelters in our county between 2017 and 2019. We found that an increasing proportion of these people have significant challenges that make it almost impossible for them to earn enough income to afford housing. 41% of the people in our emergency shelters were age 45 and older. 73% had no income whatsoever. 27% had mental health conditions, 23% chronic physical health problems, and 18% physical disabilities. These are the folks who need long-term housing assistance and supportive services designed to help them remain stably housed. Next slide. Supportive housing is also a good deal for the community because it reduces the pressure on public services. It addresses problems associated with unsheltered homeless people, the folks camping in our alleys and our parks. And most importantly, it eliminates human suffering. Next slide. Our project was modeled after the project I did in 2015 at Palm Tree Apartments that Tara mentioned through our family foundation. We rehabilitated a 1955, 24 unit courtyard start style apartment building in one of our gentrifying commercial corridors. We were able to show that with rental subsidies provided through our local housing authority, we could fund property management, maintenance and case management, keep people housed and dramatically reduce calls for public service at the property. Having a proof of concept model helped us to convince donors that the project would work long-term. Next slide. So what contributed to attracting donors and public support? First, we found the right site. We were able to locate in an area of declining poverty so that we weren't increasing the concentration of poverty in areas in our community. The local city council member supported the location, which was on the edge of a commercial area. There was a bus stop across the street with employment opportunities, affordable retail, and healthcare within walking distance. Next slide. Further, Randy's design was brilliant. He created a model for a fourplex that looks like a 1500 square foot single family home and blends in beautifully with the nearby community. Randy and Tom have been able to keep our costs under $100,000 per unit, including the cost of all the land, the community building, the offices and a laundry. This is substantially lower than most market rate apartments. Next slide. The site overall looks like a 12 home, gated single family community with lots of green space, making it compatible with nearby single family, uh, the nearby single family community and helped us tremendously in gaining community support and donor support. Next slide. Each unit is approximately 363 square feet including a separate bedroom with a double bed and a combined sitting area and full kitchen with stove, range, and microwave. We provide a love seat, occasional tables, a small kitchen table and chairs, and a TV with a local antenna, lots of windows, and built-in storage space. Last slide. To sum it up, let's do the numbers. Uh, while folks have said funding was not our major problem, it still took us almost two years to pull together all the funding for the project. The project was awarded $1.2 million from the City of Fort Worth Housing Finance Corporation, $500,000 in home funding, which is federal HUD funding, awarded through the city, a million dollars in faith-based contributions, 
$2 million from five local foundations and more than $50,000, we're well over $50,000 now, in small gifts from individual donors. These are helping us provide all the necessities a toilet bowl brush and a doormat and uh, bedding and so forth for all the, for our residents. So overall, 64% of project development funds came from private sources. Rental subsidies are provided by federal funding through our local HUD continuum of care. Tenants contribute about 20% of the revenue that supports operating costs. We were awarded 100% city and county property tax exemptions. And because the project was fully funded, we have no debt service. Finally, the city and our local city council member supported us with political support through the grant, site selection, and zoning processes. The city had developed a reasonable accommodation ordinance for properties that serve people with disabilities that allowed us to use the property for supportive housing without rezoning. So uh, that is the nuts and bolts of the project. And um, Barry, you can leave that last slide up if you like, and uh, folks will tell us if they need us to reference other slides as needed. But now I'd like to turn to our panelists and ask them to uh, talk informally about uh, the project. So Tara, please tell us a little bit, uh, because you lived through it, about the process that the city went through to decide that it wanted to uh, develop a to set aside funding for permanent supportive housing. Okay. So one of the things we quickly realized is um, compared to other communities our size, there was very little single site permit supportive housing where all the residents of an apartment uh, or in a building are chronically homeless. There were only two projects in the entire city of Fort Worth. And um, we, had, we understood that there was a huge need for permit supportive housing. Um, and so we thought it, it would be best to see how we could spark the development of several um, projects to, to produce these units. So our overall, our overall goal was 200 units. And so um, the city really liked the model of a public-private partnership and being able to secure foundation commitments um, made it much easier to secure a commitment from our Housing Finance Corporation, um, which is the board is the same as our city council. Um, and so to be able to present them with the foundations have stepped up and you know, we need to also contribute and to just show them how much of, a, of, a, of an investment this was. Um, our model had been paying a lot of rental assistance and we were able to show that some one-time funding into capital when paired with vouchers um, is a great model um, because the services pay for it themselves. Uh, so we were very excited to support it. And um, in working with New Leaf, um, we really loved their design. Like they said, it fits right into the neighborhood um, and very innovative. And they were very thoughtful in choosing the site. And so it just made a lot of sense for, for the city to want to support it. Thank you. Tom and Randy, uh, piggyback on that and, and talk about the, the site selection process, which is, is such a huge issue. Uh, the location of projects like this um, is a challenge for all communities across the United States. Um, tell us about how that happened, uh, what was challenging? How did partners help you and so forth? You want to take the first crack at it? Sure. Uh, I think the first thing was the education that uh, Tom and I went through about the uh, competing desires of the, of the community. The philanthropic community really wanted to invest their money, but one, they wanted to invest in something successful. 
but large quantities built at once, which we quickly discovered was somewhat at odds with what the neighborhoods wanted. Uh, that anything that sounded like an apartment was not uh, was not received very well by by the neighbors, and we experienced that on a number of potential sites, and quickly came to the realization that our sites, they're neat, while it may be difficult, more sites with smaller number of units that look more like the neighborhood would be uh, more acceptable and allow us to to be able to find sites that that might uh, be successful in being able to develop some uh, some projects. Um, I'm going to let Tom talk about the first site we found uh, at the beginning of this process, but it really dovetailed with the design that we came up with um, <clears throat> that had to fit the neighborhood uh, model and acceptance of, uh, of our project and uh, became an important part of, of the selection process. Tom, why don't you talk about the Quail Trail side? Sure, so the way we started, just if you want to know the mechanics, is we had a set of criteria that we needed to fit. Part of it was zoning sensitive. We had to have a, a properly zoned right site, but we also need to have something that was on a bus line, for example, close to uh, retail services like a grocery store, walking distance, those sort of things. And we literally took a map of Fort Worth uh, and gridded out in, uh, uh, in designated areas to start searching uh, literally almost property by property of what a candidate site would look like uh, because it is a, a difficult uh, number of things that we're trying to combine here. Uh, another thing that we had to, to work on is the cost of the site obviously needs is important to us because, and I think Tara may have mentioned it, one of the things that we were charged up with early on was to uh, create a project that was self-sustaining long-term. Uh, with voucher support, uh, with raising the capital funding to, to build it. Uh, what we've uh, come up with here is a system that runs uh, without additional capital funding in the future. It runs with the voucher support and the uh, tenant's uh, income. In the case of the Quail Trail site, we were fortunate to find a three-acre site. Uh, and I know you've seen a, an ex example of how we laid it out. Uh, we actually identified the site before Randy really developed the idea of doing um, the fourplexes. The, the uh, appeal to the fourplex is we can site adapt that to future sites that we're looking at. We have two candidate sites we're looking at right now. Um, and so we're using that template of a uh, building design, for example, to help us test and make sure the site works there. Uh, but floor, does that kind of give you a, a good feel for it? Absolutely. I think it's it's especially interesting to listen to how this problem because Fort Worth has has one of the highest percentages of single family zoned property in so it's it's a, a having something that didn't look like an apartment building um, was very, very important uh, to getting community support. Steve Talk a little bit. Uh, you gave us a nice background on on how on the church and and how it got into to uh, uh, this this project. Um, talk a little bit more about how about the church's role uh, in attracting uh, donors. Yeah. Um, well, first off, you know the the fact that uh, we were basically a, a group of uh, interested members of the church who were very, had a lot of compassion for the homeless and had done a lot of volunteer work in the past uh, in other ways um, with helping solve uh, the issues, but um, didn't really have any expertise in what Tara and Randy and Tom have just talked about. Uh, uh, the members of our church that were involved in this were me, you know, government employee, uh, we had a, a retired um, manager of a large CPA firm. We had a, a, a lawyer that was um, um, general counsel for a, a real estate firm uh, and, a, and a retired commercial real estate broker <laughs> that were on our task force. And 
we knew that we want, we had a significant amount of money to help and, um, but uh, enter Tara and Randy and Tom and you uh, and your expertise with uh, Palm Tree and your success with that project. And then um, Tom and Randy and Tara's uh, collaboration on what all they've just explained is uh, how we found a site and, and uh, what they've learned about navigating the processes that are involved were to, me, to us a godsend. And so that's when we created this partnership. Um, and uh, truly the, the reputation of all of the people on this panel and the entities they represent were what opened the doors to the foundations and, um, um, and um, giving. Uh, because we we have a lot of foundations that are very generous and very uh, interested uh, in helping this population in our community. And so when they saw really the dream team that we had assembled, um, it's even though it took us two years, it, it seemed like um, it uh, worked well. Thank you. Thank you. Tara, can you talk a little bit more about the process of, of attracting partners? I'm thinking particularly of um, the role of uh, after the Paulus Foundation, the Morris Foundation, in uh, uh, really stepping up to be a leader on the project. I think some of that was um, just relationship building and trying to understand um, what our local foundations uh, were investing in, in the areas of homelessness, and if they were um, satisfied with that or looking for something more. And I think what we found is they were looking for something more. Um, understandably, you know, emergency shelter is an important part of our system, um, and that's funded a lot with a lot of private funds. Um, however, when we're looking at reducing homelessness long term, that's around housing. And so being able to talk with them about the opportunity of not just mitigate some of the aspects of homelessness, but to be able to end it, I think was attractive. Um, we understood that their interest was not, for example, on the operating side of contributing to the project for 20 years. Um, but rather the one-time investment of capital uh, to help get it off the ground. Thank you, thank you. And and Morris, for example, had a very particular uh, mission uh, to helping people in homelessness and with healthcare and and other issues. So that was a great um, a great connection there. Um, Steve, talk a little bit more about um, the how we decided to uh, form the nonprofit. Some of us sit around and joke that we can't remember why we decided to form a nonprofit, but there there really were some important reasons. Uh, some of which related to uh, donors like the Morris Foundation. Talk talk to us about that a bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think from um, from my perspective, from the church's perspective, it was um, we had this large gift um, and we knew what we wanted to be used for, but hadn't really completely d determined uh, the best vehicle for that. And um, um, we have we have created nonprofits in the past uh, for specific projects that um, it was best for the church not to actually own. And so um, it was felt that um, for a lot of reasons that this entity needed to be separate and apart from the church, even though the church was supporting it. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons that um, we supported um, starting a, a, a 501c3. And so, of course, also becoming tax exempt help to, uh, to uh, acquire gifts as well, because uh, um, a lot of the foundations wouldn't really talk to us until we had that, that status. 
And that 501c3 was also extremely helpful uh, when we started to to address uh, property tax exemptions. Um, I know for my family foundation, it was not at quite as easy because of the structure of a family foundation to be able in the state of Texas to get those, those 100% property tax exemptions, which are really, really important to make the project operationally feasible over the long term without constant infusions of cash. Um, Talk a little bit more, um, Tom and Randy, about some of the challenges uh, particular to forming public-private partnerships. Well, I'll let Randy talk on that, but let me just uh, mention real quick one other aspect of the uh, property tax, or excuse me, having a nonprofit set up is being sales tax exempt on materials on the construction side of the project. It's another big number, along with uh, Flora, you mentioned the property tax exemption uh, going forward, which is critical to the equation, especially here in Texas. Yep. Right. Well, I, I think also it'd be really important to clarify, I think, some of the people, some of the participants in this, in viewing this, uh, this session uh, have had a question about wraparound services. And I think one of the important uh, aspects of this model uh, being able to raise the money, we didn't have any debt going forward. Therefore, any revenue we could get through the vouchers or through people's portions of their supplemental uh, income uh, could go directly into operating the facility. And in that operation, uh, you know, it's uh, being able to be successful was really dependent on having no property taxes. That's a reoccurring uh, expense every year. And then, of course, uh, you know, having a limited or uncertain revenue stream, having no debt, made it possible for us to create an operational model that allowed us to pay for uh, case management, uh, management of the property, uh, a reserve fund for taking care of the property over time. And uh, it, the we tried to incorporate all of the services that the residents would need into the operational model that would be paid for by whatever revenue there is. So there's not a lot, there's no excess revenue as it were, except that any excess revenue goes back into the budget to help fund the reserve fund for uh, future maintenance and uh, for any additional uh, costs associated with services for the residents. Um, you know, putting together the, the partnership, you find, uh, I think with, with some divine intervention, you find allies that all bring something different and that know somebody different and can help direct you someplace. Uh, as I said, it was a, uh, a rather rigorous process for Tom and I to learn. We thought, how hard can it be to build some housing for some people? Uh, well, we found out very quickly how hard it could be. Uh, it was much harder than we thought and for many, many reasons that we never thought about. So uh, having partners that could help diffuse that, Tara was just uh, awesome in uh, helping us navigate the city. Uh, Flora was unbelievable in helping us identify what the operational issues were gonna be and the cost and in designing the facility, what the residents may need and particular issues that may arise from a security standpoint or a health standpoint or, or some other reason. So finding these partners and you know having them on the team, it, it really made the difference in us being able to approach as a, as a group to approach some of the foundations and the other funding sources. Uh, I would be less than Candid, if I didn't say that uh, many of the our major uh, foundations were skeptical. Uh, they've seen a lot of initiatives for homelessness, and some of them have not been successful. People with good intentions, and it just never really was sustainable. And I think what they wanted to see is for us to prove that we could build something, and it could be sustainable. 
Part of that is selfish because they don't want, as Flora mentioned earlier, and I think Tara also mentioned, they don't want to continue to have to be depended upon for operations of of uh, you know facilities that they help to spawn. If they did, they'd have a you know an unmanageable burden uh, as many as many initiatives as as they help to uh, fund and create. So. Uh, they really wanted us to prove it and had a number of them tell us when we left sessions with them and presentations say, hey, we're watching. We want to see this proven. If it is, uh, we're on board. But you guys are going to have to show us that this can work. And uh, they they like the model. They believe in the model. But they've got to see the model operating, which is which is what we're doing. And now we're ready to go back and, and try to get some more projects funded. But it took all the partners in that effort to be able to uh, to have the credibility to get that first chance at this project model. Hey, Flora, can I just add one thing to that? Uh, that's that's a very good yeah. point. And um, I think one of the things that helped us convince the, the foundations was the success of your project at Palm Tree, uh, because that was the template um, you had pioneered that and you had made it work there. And when we told them that we were going to try to duplicate that, that, uh, that model, uh, that really helped them understand that it could work and, uh, and, uh, helped uh, them to, uh, be willing to be our partners. Thanks. The, uh, uh just under. During Randy's discussion of, of sustainability, um, there's research out there on uh, nonprofit uh, affordable housing projects across the country, and they are notoriously undercapitalized. And as years go by, uh, they don't have enough room in their operating budgets to really put enough, uh, enough money uh, back into the project. And uh, I, one of the things I just want to say kudos uh, to our project management team of Randy and Tom. Uh, Tom is an absolutely brilliant uh, development project manager and he, uh, they gave us a budget for the project, what, two years ago? And we are still at that budget. And that's after uh, Snowmageddon in Texas has, has raised uh, uh, material costs, material delays, labor shortages, uh, COVID-19, and all of those problems. And we are still at the same budget at just under $100,000 a unit. Absolutely amazing. Um, Tom, did you want to say just a little bit about the uh, the the challenge of contracting, uh, working through the, the developing the government grants uh, from the, the city. Yeah, we can do that. Sure. sure. I, I think uh, what what you find, and, and uh, I think Tom will be able to join in here once I, I say what I'm about to say. This is not to... Um, criticize processes because you have to have processes for you know all of these good good uh, intention people trying to get into the business of some type of public realm and when HUD has requirements uh, they seem almost overwhelming uh, the the goals are are again uh, we found many of these competing goals in that we're trying to find contractors that are residential contractors that can build our project in the most cost-effective manner that we can. And at the same time, they're not very familiar with HUD requirements, HUD contracting requirements, you know, getting documentation from their subcontractors. Uh, you know, the best price, even though the residential uh, you know, contractor that we have in charge of the project, and he's doing a great job, but his subcontractors may never have seen an invoice before or had an invoice. You know, many of his things were, you know, something written on a piece of paper and they had a handshake deal and they knew they were going to get paid. Well, that doesn't work very well with contracting with a, 
you know, with a government uh, uh, subsidy at some point, either through a uh, forgivable loan or through the processes of uh, getting the grant. And uh, Tom has spent an incredible amount of time translating English to English so that uh, we would have the correct documentation for the city folks that have to administer these uh, funds. And uh, we've had to navigate some major uh, hurdles with how to manage the funds, how to create, as the, the city has struggled, frankly, with the fact that we have no debt because so much of this, uh, uh, these funds are tied to some type of debt associated with the project. And uh, when so many things are based on your debt and you have no debt, that, that can create quite a uh, conundrum for the people that have boxes to fill out and, and uh, items to check off their list. Uh, and you have to have those guidelines and lists and checklists in order to be able to get a project done successfully. But sometimes the way we're doing the project doesn't necessarily fit into all those boxes. So it's been a challenge that, that Tom has spent a lot of time working with it and, and us working with our, our uh, contractor. And I'll add real quick, how we got there was uh, on, for purpose of uh, being cost effective and that sort of thing, we wanted to design a residential, a simple residential house that could be built by residential contractors. And we uh, appreciate that huge savings which we've done. But along with that is just what Randy described of when you have those contractors that don't have that skill set that are familiar with HUD, we've got to fill the gap. We figured out how to do that. Uh, the city of Fort Worth has their regulations they need to work with, but I'll say this, their staff has been great to work with and uh, we've got through the process at this, you know, to this point. Let me ask you to close out this section of the questions and then we'll go to, to questions from the audience. But what are your last thoughts after living through this? I still remember I was on vacation and this was what, uh, three years ago and or two years ago, three years ago, probably. And, and uh, I was trying to bring a project along and and we were desperately thrashing around trying to figure out how the city could participate. And we finally just gave up and <laughs> said, we're not ready yet. We need to figure this out some more. Um, so, so give us some, some of your overall thoughts on the public private partnership. I think the strong relationships are very important. Um, because this is a very difficult and frustrating process. <laughs> and um, things happen that you don't anticipate um, that can really throw a wrench in things. And I think that's why it's really important to have that strong working relationship and um, trust with partners is so that we can come together and kind of pick up the pieces um, and move forward. Um, it took a long time when I was, I talked with dozens and dozens and dozens of people about that the city has this money and we didn't want to do permanent supportive housing. And I don't think most people believed that the city was going to do that. And so I'm very appreciative for, um, for Randy and Tom, um, believing that this was a possibility and not just a dream that we could really make that happen. Um, I'm very appreciative to Steve and First Presbyterian Church. They stepped forward and did a huge thing. When I mentioned this in presentations, people asked to make sure they heard right, that a church donated a million dollars to help house 48 chronically homeless people. And so many thanks to Flora. Her model of palm tree has given us credibility and a wonderful solid model that foundations respected, that the city has come to see is just a, a very good model and it makes our, um, makes our investment um, 
account. Um, because the, obviously when we're talking about public money, there's a lot of scrutiny. And to be able to point to something very successful and then also to show who our partners are and the respect they have in the community, that is key. Thank you so much, Tara. We've got a bunch of questions. Um, and yeah, um, I can uh, I can read those off a little bit um, and give I guess the panel a chance. And there's a couple here. Um, actually, um, Tiffany kind of posted the, in in light of what just happened, and there's a link to the statewide ban on homeless encampments. You know, approved by. Texas Senate, so that might be coming down the pike. She's asking about um, just the scalability of the project. And I've, I'm hearing at every level from, especially from Tom and Randy, the, I guess at every level, there's obstacles to scalability. So um, if, you know, in a smaller city like San Marcos, they don't have a million dollars, um, you know, they might have, you know, some space, but, um, you know, how do you how do you scale this to a um, with with a smaller city, um, and what would that look like? Kara, can I ask you to, to talk about that? If you if you only had a half a million dollars and you had a small homeless population, um, after all that you've learned, what would what would you do with that money? Okay. So. Um, the COVID has not been kind to motels and hotels, and some of those are in trouble now. So I would try to find a small motel with an owner that is um, eager to sell and see how you could um, maybe get the community to chip in on some renovations. Uh, but I would also not settle for the half million there's a lot of state and federal money coming in um, with the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. And so I would do both of those things. Try to find something cheap, but also try to go after a lot more money. Um, what, what wraparound services are included as part of this project? So uh, we, uh, this is 48 units. So we have two full-time case managers uh, with offices on the property. They'll be there uh, during the business day, five days a week. And then that, that the residents will have their cell phones um, for emergencies on the weekends. Um, we're also on this project exploring hiring uh, a part-time activity and volunteer coordinator to help do more in the way of, of bringing activities onto the site and helping people get to things to do uh, off the site, helping people get to their providing transportation to uh, health care uh, appointments, maybe job appointments, maybe grocery shopping and so forth. Think almost uh, so that's uh, those are some of the kinds of supportive services we provide. We partner with a lot of healthcare providers um, uh, to help our folks uh, with uh, mental health and physical health problems. Um, at Palm Tree, we've uh, in in the five years we've been open, uh, half a dozen people have passed away from chronic illnesses. Um, so we're giving them a place to live with dignity and support. Uh, as they deal with their illnesses and and and, and their lives, uh, we also have a huge partnership with the food bank. They bring uh, fresh food and protein on site, which is far better than our residents could get at the local pantries. Um, and we found that this was absolutely critical because people just literally didn't have enough food because they are still, even though they're housed, they're excruciatingly poor. Jessica asks, who's responsible for like upkeep and of the property or repairing damages? The, we are, in addition to hiring a case management agency, we also hire a property management company. And um, this is a company that 
uh, has experience working in the affordable housing, housing world, um, has a lot of sensitivity to the disability of, of our residents. And their job is to, we try to have the, the residents have as normal a tenant relationship as possible with the property management company, uh, because that's, that's just good for them to, to normalize their lives. And uh, we, uh, the property management is responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance. And then we accumulate um, uh, revenue over time. Uh, and we have a long range uh, uh, repair and replacement um, program for the, the big ticket items like roofs and, and so forth. Um, have there, oh, that's kind of a similar one. Let's go. Dot actually asked, how, how did you approach and engage nearby neighbors? Um, did you encounter the not in my backyard kind of pushback? And if so, um, you know, how did you earn the neighbors respect and trust in that regard? Uh, Tara, I can add some comments. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Why don't you go ahead? Okay, okay. Um, we have frankly um, kept a fairly low profile and a lot of our success has been the tremendous support from the council members in our area. Um, uh, I can talk about Palm Tree a little bit. When we first opened Palm Tree, uh, we did have a significant backlash from the local neighbors. And frankly, they were very frustrated that there was nothing they could do to stop the project uh, because it was uh, it was an apartment. We were just going to uh, put the apartment under different management. Um, but we met with the neighborhood associations. We had some very long conversations, a number of conversations about what their concerns were. Um, one of their uh, concerns was that there was a significant amount of camping in their in the neighborhood and they were saying well if you're going to do this anyway can you do something about these people who are sleeping in our alleys and parks and so um, we made it a specific target of the palm tree apartments to um, first house the people who were camping in the neighborhoods and we were able to make a significant dent and i think um tara's been learning that uh our, our unsheltered homeless people um, have a lot of ties to the communities where they're camping. So this seems to be a winning strategy. Anything else on that, Tara? I agree with Laura's assessment. I think um, it's important to be very thoughtful about how you engage the community. I admit I had nightmares about, about something being on next door, um, the neighbor app, and stirring up a lot of nimbyism. Um, there was a lot, I had a lot of anxiety about that. That did, that did not happen. Um, there are sp some specific protections um, for people with disabilities. And I think it was important that we utilize those um, for example, one of our administrative processes is if the land is not zoned for multifamily, um, but all the residents have disabilities, it can be done through an administrative process rather than a public zoning hearing. And so I really feel that that um, worked. Um, it protected the rights of people with disabilities, and so we were get, going so we were able to go ahead with the project. Um, I remember speaking, there's a local Greek Orthodox church. Um, they wanted to learn about homelessness. And so I was able to talk about that not very far from your church, there's going to be some housing and answer a lot of questions. And I think when there's time and space to really answer people's questions, that the nimbyism dies down. But when you don't have that space, when it's something reactionary that gets out there, like on a next door app or Facebook or something that's about fear mongering, um, that's when it, it's, it's very much a danger to the project. Uh, I am uh, 
staying in communication with a number of the neighbors. There are very few residential neighbors right around the Quail Trail project. Um, they do have concerns uh, about the typical concerns about property values and so forth. Um, even though the research uh, shows that property values do not go down with the uh, advent, the inclusion of, of affordable housing and housing for special populations. Um, but it's it's these one on one conversations, too, I think that's just making people sh making sure people know that they have somebody to call who is responsible for addressing their concerns. I've got a Randy, question here. Yeah, let me uh, Barry, let me let Randy uh, chime in on that a little bit. Randy, can you unmute? Oh, there. Yes. You go. OK, I think. Uh, one of the things that uh, needs to be pointed out is the property at Quail Trail was zoned commercially. So taking it to residential is actually going to a less intensive <clears throat> use. And I think that was that was a benefit to us. Uh, I will tell you that there have been other. The key is also having the city, as Tara said, having the city councilman support. Uh, because we use the city council staff people for each city councilman to test, uh, you know, their feelings about individual sites before we ever even attempt to get anything <laughs> under contract. Um, we had another site in an area that uh, the councilwoman said that she was supportive of it. It was actually owned by the housing authority. And uh, there were some objections, I think, uh, unreasonably raised by uh, a neighbor. And uh, she, she re reneged on her uh, support. So it does happen. But in that case, we use the council person and we hope to have uh, an opportunity to work with her again. And we moved on to the next site. Um, I think that that, you know, that's going to be inevitable, but we've really concentrated on sites that might be either already zoned multifamily or are commercial in nature or even industrial in nature that might be in a suitable location that we could take back. And if we used uh, the mechanisms that Tara was talking about to serve uh, people with disabilities and some type of administrative process, we would do that where we would actually be taking the use to a less intensive use or be in an area where it'd be more appropriate. I wanted to drop back and address one thing real quickly that was talked about previously, and that was about the size of the project for a small city. It's really important to note that part of our design too is that uh, a case manager can generally manage about 24 uh, residents or 24 units. We have 48 on our side, therefore we have two full-time case managers, but you could do a smaller project with, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 12, you know, uh, units that, uh, you know, uh, or up to say 20 would probably be the most effective for having one case manager for those. And it really depends on how you get your uh, funding for your case manager. If you have case managers that work out of a central office and go and serve people at sites, which we we're not using that model, but if you did, you could you could build smaller projects on on a smaller scale and use a model similar to ours, where you would build in increments of four. You know, you could do two four unit buildings and do eight units or or twelve. But if you have on site case management. It's most cost effective to do at least 24, uh, maybe 20, uh, but uh, you could use a similar model. You just have to scale it back. Uh, what we're finding is finding appropriate sites uh, seem to always be in the three or four, two or three or four acre size. Um, finding one bigger than that is a problem. Finding one less than that's a problem to get critical mass. And that, uh, you know, you can get about 48 units of quadruplexes on a three acre site. 
and it totally depends on shape, topography, all those things. But that's just what we're finding, and uh, that's what we're using as our broad criteria to begin to look to help us sift through sites very quickly, uh, based on increments of uh, you know of, of 24, 24 units or six buildings at a time. How many of those of those types of uh, units could we get on a site? But I wanted to draw back and address that because the operations and case management all, management also helps drive the uh, the size of the project. Uh, even for a small project. So something to think about. We've got time for maybe just one, one more question, I believe. Um, I'll put these, um, um, well, a couple a couple of them here. The um, What's the predicted lifespan of these units, Dan asked, and um, Jessica was asking also about the maintenance issues. Um, have there been any like major ones? Those might kind of go together. Um, can you just speak to that just briefly? Sure. Uh, the these are uh, this this new project uh, should have a very very long lifespan. It is the intent of the owners, the nonprofit that owns the project, that they will in perpetuity be allocated to supporting housing for people who are homeless. Further, the uh, the grants that we got generally have. Uh, 20, 25 years, Tom, is that right? Uh, required that in order for the uh, the loans, their forgivable loans to be forgiven, we have to continue to serve chronically homeless people with disabilities for at least 20 years. Um, uh, maintenance problems uh, uh, come and go in in this, I am so excited to have a project that is new construction because at Palm Tree, I have a 1955 building that I'm still trying to, to maintain. But, um, and, and for the most part, when residents leave, as they sometimes, you know, either pass away or move on, the, the idea is that residents will be able to stay in the units as long as they need to. Uh, some of them may be able to emerge to use some other kind of a housing subsidy, like a housing choice voucher. Uh, but uh, occasionally we do have residents who have uh, problems and have uh, contributed to damage in the units. And uh, that you do have to be ready uh, to be able to repair, you know, replace an air conditioning system. Uh, for example, um, so, uh, but that is not, uh, I would say in the six years that we've been at Palm Tree, uh, we've only had a few units that have had substantial uh, tenant damage. Okay, I, I think actually we've gotten all through the questions I didn't, um, some of you are asking questions and uh, panelists were responding. So within that, so I'm not going to repeat all those, of, but I am going to archive them, make sure we're good. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wow. What a wealth of information. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Thank and Barry, I hope, yes. I hope everybody, everybody, um, please feel free to reach out to us individually through our contact information. We would absolutely be delighted. It's our mission in life to see that this happens more and everywhere. So contact us with questions. Please. Yeah. What a, a wealth of resources here. And um, hopefully um, those of you have um, per, um similar pursuits can find a way to to scale and make it happen so um just real quick um this um workshop has been recorded in in about a minute or so i'll i'll stop the stream and uh, i believe it'll be available on this platform until august so at least um three months so have a shelf life if you need to come back and watch or maybe someone on your staff um uh, you can bring them in and log in and let them watch with you. And um, so that's there for you guys. Uh, our next session, workshop session, begins in about 10 minutes um, at 11.15. Is that correct? Yes. So um, anyway, just back to the lobby uh, at the top left, and we'll see you next time.
Thank you, guys.